Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to render a beautiful PDF using Spring MVC. And that PDF will contain images, it will have a dedicated style sheet, we will use custom fonts like everything. If you are not subscribed yet, please hit the subscribe button or the like button, it really helps a lot. So let's go, let's code. As usual, I'm using the latest and greatest Spring Boot version 3.2, uh, the current release candidate 2. Let's talk about the dependencies because that's gonna be important. Because what we will build is a pipeline. We will render HTML to PDF eventually, and that requires a few things. So we're gonna use Timeleaf to build up the HTML, to populate it with our domain objects. Then we pass it on to JSOUP because we need proper XHTML. Then we pass it on to JSOUP, which will make sure that out of the HTML, we get XHTML, which is a little bit more strict. And this is required by the final part of the pipeline which is Flying Saucer, which will take the XHTML and render PDF using OpenPDF underneath. So in a previous video, I was using Spring Webflux and I was using iText, which is not recommended these days. So this is the pipeline that we're gonna use. Timeleaf, JSOUP, Flying Saucer. Now I prepared a few assets to make sure it's not so boring. So you can see in the resources folder, there are a couple of things that we need. You will recognize the static folder and it has a logo in there and it has a style sheet and everything in this folder will be available in the application direct. Now let's quickly check this and start the application. So let me run it. And then we go to Chrome and I refresh the page and we can see there's the logo. So you can see this is directly underneath the root path. So I'm at localhost 8080 slash and then logo PNG. I also have styled CSS, which is my style sheet, which is also available top level. This is important. We're gonna need that for the rendering later on. Okay, back in the IDE, I also brought in a custom font. You can get this on Google Fonts. It's IBM Plex Sans Regular. And down here in the templates folder, I have the invoice HTML, which will be used by Timeleaf. And I will not go into all the details of this, but you can see this is proper HTML, so we could also render it in a browser. And it is using the Timeleaf namespace here to render individual objects that we're gonna build now. As usual, let's start with a controller because this is where all the magic is gonna happen. I call this invoice controller because in this example, I just assumed that we will have an application that is rendering PDFs that are invoices. So we go with the rest controller. And then we want to add one mapping, which is a gap mapping. And let's call this invoices. And then we have an ID and it has uh, the extension PDF to just make sure that this endpoint is only hit for PDF documents. We call this invoice and then we have the path variable call this ID, I make it a UUID, which I usually use for these kind of um, public URL, so to say, because it should be possible for anyone down to download an invoice just knowing the URL. So this is a UUID and I leave this blank because we also need a domain object. So I create a data class invoice. It will have the ID, which is the UUID. Let me close this over there. Um, that has a number, which may be different, right? The ID is more technical and the number may be the actual invoice number. It should have a date, which I make a local date. And of course it needs an amount. There we go, which I usually use big decimal for. Now let's assume that whenever this endpoint is hit, we just create an invoice. Uh, so it's like this invoice with the ID that is just passed there. And it's, let's assume it's the first invoice in 2023. So then we use local date now, and the amount is big decimal one, two, three, four, five. So this is our euro amount in that example, because that's what I usually use. Now, how do we actually get that data object into a proper PDF? So the first thing that we need to do as part of our pipeline is use Timeleaf to render our template. So we first need a dependency, which is the engine, which is the spring template engine, which we can use to programmatically render templates, because usually you may do this as part of the controller. If you just return the name of the template, then Spring will do it under the hood, but you can even proactively do this if you want. So you just need the engine over here. And you also need a context, right? If you have a user controller, you have a map where you can store data that should be used by the template. We have to create that ourselves here. So this is called context and it's coming directly from Timeleaf. So context is this one. Now I can set different variables. So I'll say the name of the variable is invoice and I'm putting in the invoice that we just created. So how do we get the rendered HTML out of that? We just invoke engine process template invoice context. So why did I put invoice here? Because that's the name of the template, right? I have a template here, it's invoice HTML. I can remove the extension because that's the default. So I process that template and I pass in the context and the context has our invoice. So if we check over here in the HTML, you can see 
it uses invoice.number. So this is how I can access the properties of the invoice. It uses a sample address. So then we use some formatting here. So the invoice date is formatted in a pattern that I usually use as well. And you can see even the amount here is formatted as a currency using the help of directly from Timeleaf. So this is all prepared already. I just have to put in the invoice. So now this is the first part, right? So here, this is Timeleaf. Now we got the HTML, but now the HTML needs to be converted into XHTML, which is a little bit more strict. And this is what we're going to use JSOUP for. So we invoke JSOUP, parse, and put in the HTML that we got here from Timeleaf. So let me just rename that. So this is JSOUP. And now we have to adjust it to provide proper XML. This is exactly what we're going to do. So we set the output settings to XML. And now we need to render it XHTML, which is docHTML. So this is all the magic that JSOUP is doing. I put in the HTML and I get proper XHTML out there, which we now can pass on to Flying Saucer, which is using OpenPDF under the hood. So let's do this. Uh, this is Flying Saucer. So we need a renderer. And uh, this one is um, an iText renderer. Don't get distracted by that name. It's really using OpenPDF underneath. So now we can invoke renderer set document from string. We put in our XHTML. Now we also, since Flying Saucer is responsible for rendering, it also takes our style sheet. And just, just quickly taking a look here. The style sheet is referenced over here, right? It says styled CSS which is the style sheet over here, which should be used for rendering. Oh, and there's an important note. This is not considered uh, web media, but print, right? So if you link style sheets from here, you have to make sure that media is set to either print or all as I've done here. Otherwise it will not work. It will not use the style sheet. This style sheet is, uh, let's check that. That's using um, a custom font. So this is IBM Plex Sans, which I added here. And this is something that Flying Saucer needs for a rendering. So we have to bring it in. So we have to say renderer and then access the font resolver and add the font. So the name is a little bit different. It's IBM Plex Sans and I think it's done. Regular is the name. It's yeah, it's over there. So that's the name. Uh, true means whether it should be embedded or not. So I embed it here. Now Flying Saucer has access to the actual font for rendering. And now we have to just call layout eventually because now we're finished. And that's the whole pipeline, right? Starting with Timeleaf, then coming over to JSOUP, then to Flying Saucer, which is using OpenPDF. Now we have everything ready to render something. But what is it that we're actually rendering? So this is gonna be a byte array. So let me show you how to do this. I'm creating a stream here, and we make this a byte array output stream. Um, have to initialize with a default size. I'm using this one. So now we can use the renderer and create the actual PDF. So we call create PDF and pass in the stream. So it's getting written to that stream. And eventually we can just return a response entity. Say, okay, um, response is okay. There we go. So we have to specify the content type, which is application PDF. That's correct. And we have to add the body, which I have not created yet. So let's do this. The PDF is actually the stream to byte array. So body is the PDF. So let's see, something's missing here. It's probably the return value. Let me just clean that up a little bit because um, that can be imported, should be nicer. Now we have to add the return type because that's what we're returning now. It's a response entity byte array, that's the PDF. Uh, we've set the media type, I mean import this, that should be this one. So that should be all correct. Um, let's restart the application, give it a try. So application started, going back to the browser. And here, let me make this a little bit bigger. So now we can go to invoices and then I have to provide a UUID and then PDF. Doesn't really matter, the UUID is just an example, it could be anything. So that should actually render the PDF and you can see it does. So, well, we can see a few things are missing. So first of all, it looks pretty, pretty basic. Uh, apparently there's no CSS applied. And even worse, I provided an image that is not part of that output, right? So if we check our invoice HTML, I have the logo in here, which is logo PNG, which is also over here. And that should be part of the invoice, but it's not. So apparently we have to apply a few more things here. Let's stop the application. Let me show you what to do. We need the official public URL of our application. So I put it here um, for the sake of brevity. Usually I would just put this in properties that are overridden per environment. So. I do it like this, HTTP 
um, localhost 8080, which is where this is running locally. Again, in a real world setting, you would just put the public facing URL in here. And why is this needed? This is used for the renderer because if we go to flying saucer, the set document from string method actually takes a second parameter if you um, use that flavor, the base URL. And the base URL should be what we just added here. So I can put it in here. So while I restart the application, why is this important? Because Flying Saucer is trying to resolve the style sheet, the images and everything else relative to a given path. And that's, that's null by default. And it's unable to find the stuff over there. So let's go back to Chrome, refresh this. And now we can see actually that um, there's a bit more stuff going on. So we can see the logo is embedded. It's apparently using a different font, right? We can see this is not the default font and it's applying the style sheet because that looks a little bit different. So, and this is the important thing that we have to take care of, making sure that whenever we render something with Flying Saucer, it has the base URL against which it can resolve these kind of things. I didn't manage to find another way to make this work. Uh, if you know of a better way where we can just directly access these assets via the class path, for example, I would be super happy to know how you do this because for me it really only works if the styles and the logo that are referenced here are just accessed by the absolute URL. So before we wrap up, let me actually show you something that I also do here. I usually set some headers here. So this is HTTP headers from Spring Framework. Yeah, this is the first one. So content is position. So there are two, so you can set a file name. If you wanna download the file in a browser, for example, you can pre-populate this with a file name. And it could be, for example, yeah, um, the ID. So I don't even need to do this because it's just one parameter. So I could put in the ID that I got here, or I could use the invoice number to pre-populate the file name uh, imagely. Inline usually means it's rendered in a browser. Um, the opposite is attachment, which means as soon as you access it, it will be downloaded already. So I'm going with inline here. And there are two more headers that I usually like to set. So first of all, I don't do it like this, but using the types uh, content disposition. It's pragma um, HTTP, which is a little bit outdated, I think. I'm not sure if that's really required, but what you want to make sure is that a PDF is not cached in between somewhere in, in caches, etc. because we just dynamically generate a PDF using that endpoint. So you want to make sure that clients always get a fresh version, right? So you can set this to private and let me copy this and remove this. The other one is cache control. Uh, we can also say private and then it's must re validate. So this is the current version. I think uh, Pragma is, uh, I think HTTP one, uh, it's a little bit older. Uh, it's just for compatibility reasons. Um, and usually you would then just say, okay, headers and put in the headers as well. Uh, just renaming. Uh, it's easier to just call this header. So less refactoring. And that's a whole example. I know it's probably been a lot, but just to recap, the pipeline is really use time leaf to render the HTML then use JSOUP to create valid XHTML, pass it on to Flying Saucer, which will just generate a PDF using OpenPDF underneath. Because I've shown you how to use custom fonts, use a style sheet, use images. If you just bring it together there, you should be able to create beautifully designed PDFs. And I'm curious to see what you come up with. Let me know if you have additional questions down in the comments below. Please subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.